uh, Dr. Marie Broyles from Oak Grove Technologies, and my presentation is entitled GameSpeak for Instructional Designers. Uh, one of the first things I've noticed in going through instructional design and game design is that neither side speaks the same language, which has caused a lot of problems when you're going into production and development. So last year when I was at Game Tech, I decided I was going to do a presentation on translating Game Speak for Instructional Designers, because I had five of them following me through the whole conference. Next slide, please. Okay, so basically the game design process has many steps. Um, so these are the two processes, game design and instructional design, and I basically did an adaptation of the ADDIE model, which is pretty familiar to all instructional designers. However, most of you have never seen the game design process. It's very similar and some of the components are the same, except what we do in each of them is a little bit different as a game designer. Next, please. Okay, so in concept, that's basically the idea stage. They're doing sketches, they're coming up brainstorming, and they do a, what we call a high concept document. Then they go to pre-production where they start putting mock-ups together, they start the game design document. They'll start uh, the art style guide, they'll start solidifying what goes into that game. They've already decided basically look and feel and the major goals of the game. Prototype is they do two types. First, they do a paper one to see if it's the concepts are gonna flow. And they're also gonna do a digital mock-up, which would be like the interface and you know give the person an idea of what it's gonna look and feel. At that point, the game design document is in full control. They're developing it. They describe everything that's gonna happen in that game, what the look and feel is going to look like, what the player is going to be doing, how many characters they're going to be. All the specifications that happen in that game are in that game design document. It follows the game from concept to completion. It is similar to the instructional design document, but there's a lot of differences. Okay, after prototype, then they go into production. And depending on the game, it could take one to two years or three to six months. It depends how complex. Then they go into alpha. Alpha testing is where they do the first cut of testing to see if it's gonna work. Beta is usually open to end users, and they have two types. They have open and closed beta testing. Um, an open testing means it's for anybody to sign up for. Usually a closed testing is for their select people, especially if they have purchased previous games. Gold is when the game is certified by the game company that it is ready to go into manufacturing and post-production, uh, then they're coming up with ideas for the next games, add-ons, and any modifications that they could not fix that could wait. Those are like, if there's not a showstopper, it moves into production. Next. Okay, then in game design, we analyze. We start out with analyzing. We do, you know, look at what the, tra what the training's gonna do, what the training's gonna learn, and we do all the analysis. They do some of that in game design, but not quite to the extent that instructional designers do. And in the design phase, we put together a design document, which almost every instructional designer understands. You have your terminal objectives, and you have your enabling objectives, and you describe what's going to happen in the interaction. However, you say the word terminal objective to a game designer, and I can guarantee you they're going to run out of the room. <laughs> and the reason for that is they don't understand terminal objective and a enabling objective. To them, a game has a major goal, and that each level has either a mission object objective or an objective. So you have to translate those into things that someone can do in a game or a virtual world. And it usually means looking at what the player is supposed to achieve in that level, what tasks they have to complete. That is the one big difference. Um, in development, in most e-learning projects, you put together storyboards, you continue with uh, flowcharts, and you may do some samples and things like that. Our development cycle is not quite as long as a game design project because usually we have less time and we're doing like e-learning. Uh, implementation is when we take the game and it's ready for basically testing and it's put out there for the client ready to use. We also add another evaluation phase at the end, both formative and summative evaluation. Formative is basically we're just doing testing right after we release it. Summative is usually a year out. Sometimes our products don't even last a year out before they're outdated. Okay, so the common elements are basically our production and pre-production and our analysis phase have common elements. The design phase has several common elements 
in that we both use a design document. However, what we put in those is totally different, which is a big difference, and that's what instructional designers are not trained in because they're taught how to use a standardized instructional design document. You start off with putting in knowledge and skills, you put in the terminal objectives, and you put all that stuff in, the learning strategy. That's not always what you put in a game design document. You put in the objectives, you map out the world, and you build each level. Each level has to have a mission, but you also have to describe it, but you also have to tell the game designer or the, whoever's going to build this, what's going to happen in that level? What is the player doing? So you have to think of yourself in the game and not necessarily, you're working in a 3D environment, you're not in a 2D environment, and that is very, very difficult for most instructional designers. Production phase, then we go into, we have, production is the same. The only big difference is the medium that we're going to be delivering it. Usually in um, game design, you're usually going to use Unity, Cry, Unreal Game Engine, or any of other 200 game engines. It could be a mobile app, but the time for to build a virtual simulation takes much longer than an e-learning project. However, I did have one project two years ago where we did a, took two weeks to do one sim with three people working many hours. So you can do it. There's other games and materials that you can go out and use. One would be like Thinking Worlds is about there that they say you can just drag and drop. That's true, except when you want to customize it. So teams of game designers and instructional designers, you also have a bunch of other people to develop a game. You need a programmer. Without them, your game's not going anywhere. However, programmers don't think like normal people. And instructional designers don't speak the same language as game programmers. And they also have trouble with the artists because artists think in pictures. Most instructional designers are trained to think in words. Artists and modelers think in pictures. So in order to get what you want across to them, they need to see what you're thinking of. Just don't show them a picture and say, I want this. They want to see how it's going to be used in the environment. They want to know what, you know, what it's going to be wearing, what kind of uniforms, and the details. The programmer, what they need to know is what's going to happen in the level. What kind of action do you want? So you have to take yourself out of the instructional designer mode and think of a player. What do you want the player to do in your level that's going to get them from point A to point B and accomplish your mission? Then after that, you go ahead and go into the other final phases where you do the testing. Testing is the same on both sides, so you just do it a little bit differently on game design. So on this slide, I did a little bit different. I, I took a big picture look at games, serious games and simulations. So you can read that and see some of the major components of each. Game world. This is the big thing. This is your big picture. This is what you are designing for. Usually you have a team. You usually have your client come in, you have a SME, you have maybe a game, the artist come in, the programmer, because sometimes they can come up with ideas that you can't. And some projects, they usually just have either an instructional designer or they have a game designer come in too. However, you have to make sure you're speaking on the both the same scene. Otherwise, what you get won't be anything what you think you're going to get. So documentation, I mentioned this earlier, the two big documents that instructional designers use and game designers is the game design document. There are differences. Game design document has a lot of visuals in it and it tends to get very, very big. For one level I've done, it could be anywhere from 50 pages to 150, it depends on how big the level is. You're talking about the player interaction. An instructional design document has less graphics and spent more time with words presenting the information, like what is going to be the learning strategy. Doesn't make any difference in the game design. It does come out through the level map and what you want to get across, but it's most important to do it in thinking of a 3D world. What animations do you want? What sounds do you want? So those are the things that the designer has to think about. And most instructional designers are not trained at all in, in game design or art. They're taught basically education theory and how to make learning come alive for people. That is the primary purpose. Next. So, st 
storyboards, this is one big difference that I have fought people for. Most storyboards for e-learning that I've seen over the last 15 years are all word-based. When I've done word-based storyboards, I end up going back to the artist and the programmer many times to get changes because they didn't understand what I wanted. Most of the work that I have done, I've found I use a visual storyboard. It has graphics in it, it has images, it gives uh, any information about the player, what the player's supposed to be doing. It talks about the character, what movements the character's doing. It also includes what audio is supposed to be said at that point. And it, everything that's going to happen on that screen is in that storyboard. I also usually do a flow chart mapping out everything and where everything ties to. That's for the benefit of the programmer. Because sometimes when you're having a very long module or lesson or mission, the programmer is going to get lost of where he needs to come back to. Characters. This is probably one of the hardest things for most people to understand. Most people think game characters just sort of magically appear. They start out as a concept drawing and then you do some color mock-ups. But in order to get them to the 3D level that we use in game design, there's a lot of different processes that have to happen. And these are all terms that an instructional designer will have never heard before. So before we can even come up with a character, we have to start out with what we call a wireframe, which is the green kind of stick figure with little polys on them. That's polys. The higher the polys means the closer knit, the more closely aligned it is with the human body. Low poly figures are great for Unity if you're going to do a mobile app device. But if you're going to use the high end ones, that means it's going to take more processor speed to render it in your game world. But you're still not done. So you have a wireframe figure, but then you have to do what we call material, or we call it skinning the character. Level maps are very critical. We do this at the very beginning because one, it gives you a lay, uh, an idea of the layout, especially if you're going to do a, a village or anything you're going to have in an Air Force base, anything. We do a level map. And basically what this does is tell uh, the level designer where all the major objects are going to be and the path that the player is going to take in order to get through that level. Um, so you have like a world design over there. I have a town and a vill village and then I translated that to a level map. So we do that before we do any building in the, in the game world, any assets, anything. Because what this does is give us time to decide whether everything is in it the way we want it and whether the proportions are correct. Okay, the next thing we do after we have a level map, then we call do it what we call in blocking in. This is the next phase. What this does is the game designer and the level designer builds the block ins, and what it does is actually give them proportions to make sure that if you're going to have two buildings next to each other, if you're going to have a soldier walk between them, that he can actually walk between them. It also tells them proportion scale, and this is done so there's nothing else on there. Because what you put on top of those objects are what we call materials. So all those things, right now they have no shape. They're just basic shapes, cubes and cylinders. That's all it is. Okay, so after this, what we were go going to do in the class was I was going to walk everybody through a game scenario. Basically how to build it. So I gave, um, next slide, they have a little scenario here, and then what I was going to walk them through was how to go through doing a, basically a level map from the scenario and getting objectives and everything from a basic scenario. This was their mission. Uh, you're a member of a platoon, you have to go in and find this secret material and documents. Here are the tasks and conditions. Basically this is the same thing you would use in you know, your objectives, you have your tasks, your conditions, and the standards that they have to achieve that mission. So basically, to close all this off, one of the biggest things for instructional designers to remember is, number one, you're working in a 3D world. You're not in e-learning, you're not in 2D, you're in 3D. That means you have to think about every chair, every table, wherever the character's going to move, open a door, whatever you want them to do, you have to think of it as you're in a 3D world. It is not e-learning. Totally different environment. Number three, you have to, or two, you have to be able to talk to other people. 
and get their feedback from the listen to the game designers. They'll be able to tell you what's possible to do, what's not to do. So those are the two biggest points. And thank you for your time today. And I have our email address on there. So if anybody had any questions, you can send me a note. Okay, Dr. Broyles, I have one question for okay. you. Um, do you remember when you were transforming between e-learning and game design and you had an aha moment? Okay. Do you remember what that was? Like, oh, I get it now? It was when I was working at a bank. Um, we were going from, most of our stuff was all straight e-learning. And one of the things that the banking industry ha is required to do is, a is bank theft robberies training. And I was thinking the best way to teach that for tellers was to have a simulation where they had a robber come into the bank and then pull a gun on them and have them go through what it would be simulated like if there was an actual robbery. Yep. Because it's a, the decisions they make in that situation when they're faced with that threat could mean life or death to either them or to one of their customers. Sweet. Thank you.